Okay, listen, no one has more America-loving red blood running through their veins than me, but I think it's time we all made peace with something. There's just no getting around it, Japan is the main and probably only source of all retro games that you and I both enjoy. Now sure, you could argue that position at the top was taken round about the 360 and PS3 generation and there is some merit to that, but might I also draw your attention to all the awful nonsense that's happened to games since then? Maybe not the kind of W you want to be parading around like that. And besides, even when we do factor in the recent bout of Western game supremacy, historically speaking, pound for pound, no one's churning out bangers like Glorious Nippon does. And I'm fairly certain it's not going to surprise many of you to learn that we only ever received a very minute portion of what they have to offer. Sadly, unless you devote yourself to learning a pretty complex language, those untranslated titles are just outside your reach. Or at least that's how it used to be. Back in my early teens, I remember groups like DJAP and Aeon Genesis bringing me Japan-only games I would have otherwise never been able to play. And after some of those games would go on to affect my taste long after shutting ZSNES down on the family computer, I figure maybe it's time to return the favor to the general internet at large. Which means, moving forward, we will be covering an entire buttload of fan translations from across the console and genre spectrum. And since I'm dumb and only recently learned what a daunting task that is, I'm going to be enlisting some help from a few of my favorite YouTubers. So as this series goes on, keep an ear out for a voice or a perspective that you get into and maybe think about taking just a small break from binging all of my videos multiple times a day and check out some of the content creators who inspire me to keep improving. Oh, and in terms of content, I do have to warn you ahead of time, the vast majority of games that get unofficial translations tend to be RPGs, so get ready to see a lot of those moving forward. That being said, I will definitely try my best to spread the coverage across all the genres available. I'm not exactly sure I'll ever be able to cover every fan-made translation patch in existence, but you never know, maybe we can make a bit of a dent. And with the preamble all out of the way, I'd like to introduce you guys to a few really awesome fan translations. What's up everybody, I'm Jared and this is Avalanche Reviews. WKD4496, welcome to your new home. When the words fan translation pass your posterior superior temporal lobe, you're probably thinking what we're all thinking, a game that was translated into a different language in an unofficial capacity. And while that is correct, it's not entirely correct. Sometimes you run into special situations like here with Code Veronica X on the Dreamcast. For those of you that don't know, Capcom had chosen Sega's ill-fated Dreamcast as an exclusive platform for their next RE game about a year before the gaming public collectively read that console its last rights. Capcom, not exactly being much for exclusivity anyway, shot the game over to the PS2 and GameCube. In doing so, they added a few Wesker cutscenes, changed the intro FMV, added bangs to Steve's luscious locks, and some minor housekeeping in terms of bugs. And if there's one thing we know about this company for sure, it's that they are physically incapable of missing out on potential revenue from a re-release. So this new version of Code Veronica X was eventually ported back to its home platform, the Dreamcast. Because the PS2 and GameCube so thoroughly aped the DC's user base, most people tend to remember their time with Code Veronica with either a black or indigo purple controller in their hands, which causes a bit of conflict when it comes time to replay the game. Because on one hand, you have the added features, fixes, and new content of the X revisions, which is great, but on the other, you have the issues that often accompany video game ports. I have made a fairly in-depth video covering all the Code Veronica ports, including the HD ones, if you're looking for a more concise explanation, but if I was going to broadly sum things up, I'd say both versions of CVX exhibit video quirks that make them inferior to the original in some kind of way. On the PS2, it's ghosting, interlaced video output, artifacts in the game's font, and a much darker picture. On the GameCube, you've got to make do with almost all the previously stated issues, plus badly compressed FMVs and a controller that was definitely not made with D-pad-driven tank controls in mind. 
Now you could certainly say that none of those problems even bother you and that's 100% fine. Everyone has their taste and for all I know there's someone watching right now who finds ghosting to be a lost art form or something. But if you're like me and you prefer the Dreamcast much sharper look and cool dither pattern, there's the Code Veronica Kanzenban fan translation. Of course, the word translation there being a bit of a misnomer. What the fans did was take the already existing official English translation of Code Veronica and apply it to the X or Kanzenban re-release of the game. Which means you'll get all the upsides of playing the newer revision of the game with none of the porting downsides, and I think I'm gonna break a lot of hearts by saying, I don't really get the hype. I mean, don't get me wrong, I think it's amazing that the community came together and gave us the ability to play this version of the game, but I guess I just don't see an altered title screen FMV and new cutscenes with Wesker as being worth going too far out of your way. Which is exactly why I always stuck with the original Dreamcast release of Code Veronica, but now that I can have my cake and eat it too, why not? And it's especially nice for me because I'm bad enough with my money to have an internal Dreamcast HDMI mod, so anytime a multi-platform release has a DC version available, that's the one I'm always going to want to use for footage. I'd say for the casual person looking to play a Resident Evil side story, going through the trouble of booting backups on a Dreamcast might be a bit of a tough ask, but for those of you who are already set up to play ISOs via real hardware or emulation, you kind of don't have an excuse not to make your next CV playthrough be on its intended platform. Tell me, who do you work for? Who sent you? Now this obviously isn't the most must-have type of mod or translation out there, but I'd say it's perfect for people who have seen these games backwards and forwards. You know, the kind who are looking to mix up their next session with the game. And sure, maybe seeing Dreamcast visuals while experiencing PS2 content isn't the biggest alteration, but as I am often quoted as saying, any new reason to play a Resident Evil game is a good one. There is absolutely no getting around it, the PS2 has one of the most impressive libraries we've ever seen from a console. It was lucky enough to exist during a time when video game controllers were getting into more hands than ever before and the PS2 did more than its fair share to further that trend. Which is truly great, but what's not so great is the fact that there isn't the same wealth of fan translations for PS2 games compared to its predecessor and I think that might be due to a few different reasons. First off, the massive popularity of the console meant a good deal of the quality Japanese titles were officially localized for Western audiences already. But on top of that, the complexity and sheer amount of work that goes into breaking down an 8 gig dual layer DVD and compiling it all back together with an English script, I would imagine is a little more daunting of a task than a similar process on an 8 or 16 bit system. Regardless of the reason though, I am happy to say that there are some killer PS2 titles that managed to get fan translations, and out of those releases, I'd say Berserk, Millennium Falcon Hen, Seima Senki no Sho is likely the most well known. Now I'm going to go ahead and admit to this up front, I am a pretty fair weather Berserk fan. I've read a bit of the manga and I've watched the 1997 series more than a few times, but I am pretty uninformed as to what Guts has been up to past my little window into his world. And speaking of which, I'm not sure if anybody knows this, but I was somehow able to convince a woman to marry me. Which is news enough, but my wife also has a YouTube channel where she talks about, analyzes, and recommends her favorite anime. I mention this because about a year ago she covered that 1997 prequel run that I mentioned, and if you haven't seen the Berserk anime or you're just looking to have a cute girl talk to you about it for a while, I'd say this video is definitely worth a watch. So do me a favor and go give her some love. Tell her I sent you. Oh, and she's also a big dumb idiot, and I'm recording this part after I'm having her come down and record this. Hi, I'm PB and Joe, and I approve this message. Got her. Getting back on track though, this Berserk title was unofficially translated by Wesker90 a full ass decade ago and for whatever reason this is the first time I'm playing it for more than 30 or 40 minutes. And right off the bat, before getting too far into it, I can assure you this is a much better experience than the last time you got to control Guts in a video game. 
I mean, look, I love that Dreamcast game. I think we all did, but let's be honest here and admit it was an absolute nightmare to play in most scenarios. Using the Demon Slayer to cut monsters in half was a dream come true, but it bouncing off of any remote piece of the environment and happen to come in contact with? Well, I'd say this game alone is responsible for countless late-in-life anger issues. In Millennium Falcon, Guts feels much more fluid and satisfying to control. There's still a bit of clunkiness when it comes to changing directions on the fly and the fact that combos require serious commitment because of how long it takes to swing this massive piece of metal. That being said, I think you could definitely call this one of those rare game dev decisions that's both fairly realistic and really fun. Either way though, it seems to be a purposeful inclusion and I sorta like it. You've got your standard light and heavy attacks, so nothing new there, but fans of the series will be glad to hear that Guts' little death-dealing medieval Agent 007 gadgets play a major role here alongside assistance from the sometimes annoying, sometimes endearing Puck. Just like its Dreamcast predecessor, this game pits you against massive hordes of demons, zombies, ghosts, and just about everything in between, Sasquatch is very much included. Only this time around, the enemy mobs respawn endlessly, or at least they did in the levels that I beat. Speaking of which, levels in this game aren't quite as linear as they were on the Dreamcast, and Guts is going to have to complete certain goals in these wide areas, like destroying several enemy camps or stuff like that. Which means you'll be crisscrossing these big maps a lot, which is good, because as you do, you'll always have a screen full of bad guys to cut into pieces, and man, it is really satisfying seeing these things fly into bloody viscera depending on the angle they were cut at. I'm being dead serious, I don't know who you are and what you're going through, but I do know that you need to see an inhuman monstrosity get sliced in two so hard from a single attack that he's effectively able to watch pieces of his own body rain down around himself. And at the risk of sounding like a psychopath, it's awesome that you can keep hitting bad guys after they've died, doing even more damage to their bodily integrity. So if you thought air juggles were fun in fighting games, imagine that same exact mechanic, but your opponent's body parts fly off the more hits you get in. The story here is actually pretty interesting, with old characters like Guts' friends from the Band of the Hawks showing up. Like I said before, I'm not the most up-to-date Berserk fan, so I really don't recognize anyone here past Casca and Puck, but I imagine for some of you, these other guys being on screen will be pretty damn cool. As for the quality of the translation itself, it's not exactly what I would call ready for market. Spelling can be off, formatting's a little screwy, and some sentences make little to no sense. It may jump out at you a few times per stage, but honestly, it's not the kind of issue that makes progressing impossible, so it's not something I think about too much. The story still makes sense and the events are clearly explained, but sometimes during those explanations, you might hear an off-sounding phrase or flat-out bad grammar. Like I said though, this is still perfectly playable, which is good because this is a really fun game. I mean, don't get me wrong, I do have issues, like for example, Guts' run speed being nowhere near fast enough to make traversing these big levels feel satisfying, but who's going to complain when getting nearly the same gameplay found in the Dreamcast Berserk game, only way more fun and smooth feeling? Oh, and also, these are some really awesome looking CG cutscenes. I didn't exactly know where to put that in the script, so here it is. If you pick the game up and the combat starts to grate on your nerves, the good news is it can be relatively optional. You can have the enemies just trailing you around from place to place and there's really nothing stopping you from doing that. These guys do respawn infinitely, so in most scenarios, you're not going to have to worry about killing everything off before being allowed to proceed, although there is a leveling system that might convince you to jump into a bunch of fights anyways. You can purchase stuff like new moves, added combo hits, and faster swings with your sword, which means you can make the game much better the more you play it. The only downside being you're not exactly seeing the game's combat in the best light when you play through the first 40 minutes of it. But that doesn't exactly factor into things because as far as I'm concerned, this game's base combat and everything else is just really, really awesome. It may have a few flaws, but I think we can all agree it is infinitely more fun than the Dreamcast game, which is definitely something. I imagine fans of the anime and manga are going to want to check this one out, if anything, just for the chance to see these characters moving around on screen one more time and not looking like this. Over here. But then again, fans can be fickle and maybe this game does something crazy with a story they don't like. Who knows? I can, however, tell you this. If you enjoy brutal action games, you do not want to miss out on the pure satisfaction of chopping things into various sizes of jibs. Hi 
there, everybody. This is David over at the channel David Vink, and thank you so much, Jared, for allowing me to come on over to your channel and gush for a hot minute about my favorite fan translations, one really in particular, though. But first, I do want to talk about my experience with just emulation and fan translation as a whole. Basically, it started as a teenager after reading an article about it in the Rolling Stone magazine. Yeah, I'm old. I read about the internet in a magazine article. I know. But anyway, my brother and I couldn't believe that such a thing, like, really even existed. And we went straight home afterwards from Walden Books, and we tried to figure it out for ourselves and download an emulator and download some ROMs. And we finally did after a couple of hours. And it was really then that I kind of realized that the Final Fantasy numbering that I knew and loved my entire life was off. There were some missing Final Fantasies. There was three games that was missing, and I just had to get my hands on those, and that led me into the ROM translation scene. That was my gateway, and I spent the rest of my teenage years and my 20s working my way through the rest of Square Enix's SNES catalog. And most of them were pretty straightforward RPGs, but there was one of them. It was known as kind of the Holy Grail, the game that just could never be translated no matter what because of the way that the magic system worked. Nobody thought that it would ever become available in English, until one day, miraculously, it was. And that game, my friends, is Treasure of the Rudras. Everybody knows that 90 Square was the best square. They came out with classics that we still adore today, but at the same time they also experimented with the genre. But unlike today, their experiments weren't like off-the-wall weirdo projects that ended up alienating half their audience. Instead, they were really freaking fun! and they just took a little time and energy to get into. And Treasure of the Rudras epitomizes this experimental nature to a T. Taking many ideas from Hinduism, the world is beset by environmental pollution, and it's cursed to be destroyed and then subsequently reborn by the Rudras every 4,000 years. And it's now 15 days into the complete and total annihilation of the planet. So it's up to you, or rather a bunch of different heroes that you can control, to set forth and change the fate of the planet as well as their destiny. You see, the game kind of plays in a kind of like scenario system. Think about the introduction to Wild Arms, except that it lasts for like the entirety of the game. Each of your heroes begins in a new part of the world, and each of them has their very own story that they have to follow, and sometimes their paths will cross and they will interact with one another. You can pick and choose which hero to start with, and you can switch between them at will. Sometimes you'll go many days playing as the same group of characters, and other times you're going to have to switch them out more often so that one party can complete an objective before the next party can move on. The story also plays out differently depending on where you go first and with which team. It isn't until towards the very end of the game that everybody joins forces together to face down the root of the destruction. But what really sets it apart from other games at the time isn't just its unique take on storytelling, but also its unique take on the magic system. Rather than just leveling up and learning spells like you do in a ton of other RPGs, here you learn mantras, or keywords, I guess, and you actually type them in like an incantation. You literally type in the name of the spell, with certain words representing elemental attacks or status ailments, buffs, or healing, and other prefixes and suffixes allowing them to become more powerful or become multi-targeting, and so on. And it's exactly this particular magic system that made the translation such a daunting, laborious task. But it's also this magic system that makes the game so unique and special. You'll learn prefixes, suffixes, and spells on scraps of paper found in treasure chests, or maybe by like reading a book, or even just from a conversation. And once you learn it with one party, you can then go into the other parties and teach them those mantras as well. So you could conceivably go like 10 days with one party, learning all the powerful mantras that you can, then start with the next party on day one, and go ahead and teach them end game magic spells. Each path and hero also learns their own unique spells too. The whole thing is just so fun, so delightfully experimental, and just so radically different from everything else in their illustrious catalog that I would personally love to see this redone in an HD 2D remaster. Kind of like how they redid Live Alive. I mean, they did say that they were going to be going back into their catalog and remastering some SNES titles, right? So here's hoping. Thank you again, Jared, for having me on. I'm David Vink, and everybody else out there, have a good day.
Vampire Panic, on top of being an action game released on the PS2 in 2004, is another one of those games that I bought here in Japan but wasn't able to fully enjoy thanks to the language barrier. Since buying it all those years ago, I would try to brute force it a few times, but I would always come up against a wall. Well, round about 2020, Transgen got the wild idea to translate the game to English, and that's what we're looking at right now. The story starts out with a fight between two guys and a vampire, and it goes about as well as you would expect a fight with a vampire to go. After one of these vampire hunters gets knocked to the ground and the other one knocked off a cliff, we switch to the present where our protagonist Mary is berating a castle guard which causes this mafioso looking guy to walk out and we find out that these two right here represent a group called Isla, which is apparently a band of demon exterminators and it's at this point that I have to point out just how absolutely awful this translation is grammatically. It might be one of those cases where the game was first translated to something like Portuguese and then that was translated into English, or maybe the result of feeding the entire script through a translation app. I'm not really sure, but the results can be absolutely hilarious sometimes. On the plus side, the story is perfectly followable, you're just gonna need to rewire your brain to keep up with all the weird sayings. Getting back to the actual point, we find out that this town was built on top of a dungeon where a vampire was sealed away a long time ago and that recently, he's become less sealed away than he used to be. So the guys at Isla were called in to deal with the problem, and I guess these two showed up a little late, which could either mean good luck for them or bad luck for Cliffhanger over there. Although I did stumble across a pistol in the game, so I imagine we're going to come across this guy again. But anyway, since the previous tussle, it seems like the vampires recovered and gotten right back to work at sucking the townspeople dry, leading to an infestation of ghouls and the soon-to-be ghouled. In terms of gameplay, we're left with what I would call a pretty weird little setup. This church ends up becoming your base of operations, with the goal being to venture out little by little, returning with all the survivors you can get your hands on on the way. Think Super Castlevania 4 meets Dead Rising. Which means yes, this game uses escort missions as one of its primary mechanics, and yes, those escorts are every bit as frustrating to rescue as their equivalent at the Willamette Mall. I really can't stress to you how easy it is to hit these guys when you're fighting, and when you're not hitting them, bad guys will be. Now to be fair, you can command these people to just wait in one spot while you go and take care of the threats on every screen, but if you have enough of them gathered in one place, the vampire can just randomly spawn in, and that adds a whole new dimension of frustration to things. Outside of the escort missions, combat suffers from what I would call a weird flaw. Your attacks drive you ridiculously far from your starting point, and the developer's answer to this, instead of having them not launch you into the atmosphere, was to include a lock-on system. One that is all but 100% necessary to progressing in the game. But hey, when you're actually using it, you stop scooting past the vampire trash you're trying to attack, so mission accomplished, right? Well, it would be, if it worked right. Locking onto enemies requires a sort of line of sight. You've got to be facing them, and a lot of these bad guys are going to be moving in very fast. Making it very easy for you to hit the lock on button the microsecond they dash in for an attack, leading to you locking onto a survivor and brutally beating them within an inch of their lives. That exact scenario happened to me no less than four or five times while I was capturing footage, and it is exactly as much of a mess as it sounds like, but if I'm being honest, it does have an appeal. In between furious restarts, because I swear to god I can definitely clear this room without killing the two townspeople in it, I would run into a fight and just totally dominate. It feels like a very the guy who swings first wins kind of game, so when I was aware of what was in store for me, I could deal with things in a way that made the combat actually kind of satisfying. The game starts you out as the dorkily named Rusty, but I found Mary to be way more fun. She's much faster and has a transformation that buffs all of her moves. Using her demon form combo as a hard knockdown with an OTG finisher is a really great feeling, I assure you. And you know, besides the actual game mechanics, I have to say I really like the idea of venturing into a town overrun with ghouls trying to cure the lucky ones who were only recently infected. I mean, on paper, it makes sense. As you rescue townspeople, you can receive gifts from them, and in the process of looking for more survivors, you can come across ore which can be used to strengthen your weapons. There genuinely is some cool stuff going on here, it's just the idea of getting the townspeople from one side to the other where things really start to get in the way. 
As an example, all of the monsters that you've killed will respawn at a screen transition, which means if you don't exactly know where you're going and you have to retread a lot of ground, you've effectively made the game a lot harder for yourself. And that means that one of the game's coolest mechanics, that being the ability to have multiple people follow you at once, including children who can be carried if you want by the way, gets zero room to shine. Because realistically, you just can't risk having this many potential friendly fire cases standing all around you when this well-dressed asshole teleports in. <laughs> I would say graphically, Vampire Panic is a split case. On one end, the character designs are very cool and the 3D graphics occupy a space just outside of impressive but also clear of ugly. The only real issue is a very, very muted washed out color palette. Honestly, most screens in the game can be broken down to shades of gray and brown. And listen, it's no secret that I'm not an artist, but I say that when your game is already very dark, you probably don't also want to limit the amount of colors on screen arbitrarily. But, you know, that's just me. Overall, I'd say Vampire Panic was a little underwhelming for me, but that being said, there's still something cool going on here. The game's obviously fighting its hardest to compete with what I would say is a very strict budget, but the potential is most definitely there. I will admit that it did piss me off to the point of rage quitting, but in its defense, some of my favorite games also do that to me. I'd go ahead and give this one a tentative recommendation. I mean, it is what it is, a cheap little PS2 action game with a cool gothic sort of mood lighting to help things along. It's far from substantial, but for me at least, it's really cool finally being able to get past the first 10 or 20 minutes of the game. And while I can understand not wanting to dive into a translation that might have this many errors, I mean, that is how I felt too, but by the time I was on my third laugh out loud dialogue interaction, I understood that this was an untapped source of comedy gold and I can genuinely recommend it on that alone. Sakura Wars is a series you really couldn't call popular, but isn't exactly unheard of either. I mean, there is a fan base for these games you would not believe here in Japan, but English speakers got so few chances to officially check the series out that it never really caught on in the West outside of the underground import scene. Now sure, you may argue that it being a Japanese dating sim with a tiny amount of SRPG gameplay growing off of it like some kind of a fetal tumor did it more harm than any lack of localization, but we're not here to go around saying a bunch of stuff that's totally 100% true. What we are here to do though is check out the aptly named Sakura Wars Translation Project, a fan translation of the very first game in the franchise on the Sega Saturn. One that I have to say is very, very well made. I mean truly, if you put this thing in front of me with no explanation, I would have assumed it was an official English release. And I say that right up front because this translation does exactly what I think it should do. It gets out of your way to the point where you're no longer aware that it exists. So if I don't mention it again, that's because it's so damn good at being a translation, it's effectively blended into the background noise of my mind. And because, well the gameplay sort of steals the spotlight anyways. And if you don't play Sakura Wars, you won't know that that was a very, very funny joke. I could think of a lot of stuff to say about Sakura Wars gameplay, but I think the first thing that comes to mind is you do not see what's happening here very often outside of the modern Fire Emblem series. And for those of you who've played neither of those franchises, that's a strategy RPG rolled into an anime-style visual novel, the whole thing deep fried in gallons of dating sim. In the game, you play as Ichiro Ogami, a Japanese Navy ensign who just transferred to a secret Tokyo combat unit and the emphasis there is certainly on the secret part. He shows up for his assignment at a theater house and while wondering if he's in the wrong place or not, the actresses and the theater manager welcome him as a new employee of the Tokyo Grand Imperial Theater. At first, he seems pretty sure they're confused about what's going on here, but they have all of his info and it does kind of seem like the Navy purposefully transferred him to a playhouse to finish out his military career. He's given the job of Ticket Boy at first, and it's crazy how Ogami basically speedruns reserving himself to his fate as a low-level theater employee. I mean, you gotta wonder if this wasn't just some kind of a deep-rooted dream of his and he's trying to play it off like, oh damn, I, 
I guess I'll join the fabulous world of Japanese theater. Mill anyways, he makes the best of it and familiarizes himself with his fellow employees, which, you know, this is a late 90s anime influenced game, so each one of them is going to be a cute girl of some kind of stereotypical archetype, including a character who seems to be a preteen. Now, I would love to tell you not to worry about that, but let's be honest here. There's easily a 40% chance there's some kind of a romance option available for this girl. I mean, I haven't finished the game yet, but my instincts are telling me this is not going to be the one Japanese dating sim that's going to decide not to cross that line. But anyway, setting that potential nightmare in the future to the side, as you go around talking with more of your peers, you'll start scoring points by saying stuff you think they might want to hear. Which does sound like they're training a sociopath, but in all honesty, I had a lot of fun with this aspect of the game. You never really know how someone is going to react, so you have to pay attention to how each character behaves and the kind of stuff that they're into. Now some of you might be wondering exactly when the whole SRPG thing comes into play and trust me, when I got to hour one, I was wondering the same thing. Don't worry, eventually you will get to play a strategy RPG, I promise you. After a pretty routine day at the theater, some kind of weird alarm starts sounding and the whole troop heads to a secret basement where Ogami realizes the whole playhouse thing is a front to ensure the secrecy of this experimental unit. It seems like all the actors here can use spirit energy, which is required to pilot their cute little multicolored mechs. Combat in the game is about as simple as it gets, but that doesn't mean it's bad. In fact, I kind of get into it. I mean, it definitely does help that the sprite art is really good looking, but mostly this is just a very brass tack strategy RPG. No complex leveling or deep subsystems, just move, attack, special attack, and defend. There are no items or MP to worry about, so healing is handled through a specific heal option that can be used a few times in a single fight, and the specials use a meter that either fills while taking damage or when you choose the rest command. Each unit has their own specialties like long range or high defense, but as you might have expected, how you treat these girls in the visual novel sequences will decide some of those stats in battle. And speaking of which, while interacting with your party members, there are a few things that might affect how they feel about you. First, these time decisions right here do not give you a lot of leeway, so you're going to need to really make the right call in a super limited amount of time. At certain points, you can also examine things about your fellow mech pilots in a more physical sense, and if you're wondering, yes, you absolutely can ogle their, let's say, 2D assets. By the way, this has absolutely nothing to do with what I just said, but it just so happened to fall in the script in this location, but I really, really was surprised how much I got into this game. And I really recommend you guys check it out, even if you don't get into visual novels, because I also don't. I will have to warn you of two things up front, though. Number one, this game is mostly visual novels, so don't go expecting a Tactics Ogre rival here. I'd say for every hour of chatting up girls you spend, you might get a good 6-10 to 10 minutes in combat, which did throw me off at first. I never really played the Sakura series, despite always wanting to check out the Dreamcast one, so I didn't really know what to expect when I first tried this one, and I assumed there would be at least an even portion of the two gameplay styles. But with this one at least, you're going to be spending most of your time fighting the ever-present urge to have Ogami examine every girl's boobs in the surrounding area. And the second issue is, regardless of how awesome I think Sakura Wars is, it's very much a product of its time. What I'm trying to say is this game feels a lot like an old 90s harem anime, and if you're not into that stuff, I very much doubt this is going to be what brings you over. On the plus side of both of those complaints though, I actually ended up enjoying the visual novel parts much more than I expected, and the story is something that feels like it was ripped straight out of some random anime bootleg you might have gotten a hold of and some CD import shop back when you were a teenager. Also, I love both the time period this game set in and its awesome pixel art. For some reason, the heavily westernized 1920s version of Japan has always been interesting to me visually, and for obvious reasons, old Sega Saturn 2D art has a special place in my heart, so it's a winning combination if you ask me. And hey, as icing on the cake, there are hand-drawn cutscenes in that oh-so-recognizable Saturn style. That is to say, compressed to hell and back and at a very, very low resolution. And really, I kind of like that. There's something kind of wholesome about a Sega Saturn FMV that, I don't know, I always really appreciate.
You know, for a guy who came into this not really liking visual novels, I'm kind of surprised, but I'm really impressed with what I saw here, and I'll most definitely be checking out the other games in the series. I mean, if this first one is anything to go on, I have to assume the rest of them are also equal parts Tenchi Muyo and Samurai Pizza Cats. Which, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, I probably didn't have to review this game so much as just start out this section of the video with that quote right there. If there's one tragedy of the modern experience, it's that beat-em-ups have fallen so far out of favor with the average person buying video games. Although I do kind of get it. There's just something about the beat-em-up format that doesn't jive very well with modern gaming standards, which you probably should read as a compliment to beat-em-ups. Still though, it would be really nice if we all still existed in a gaming scene where an upstart company felt emboldened enough to put out a side-scrolling beat-em-up for a new console's launch title. Speaking of which, Nekatsu Oyako was released in 1994 in Japan and translated almost exactly 10 years later by Pentaro Zero. It was a launch title for Sony's brand new fangled game Majigger and was meant to advertise all the new stuff that could be done on the PS1. And somewhat on that note, I captured all of this footage with my buddy Import Gaming for the win, and at the time he said the slowdown we were experiencing was not common for the game. So we hopped on YouTube and were able to find videos of it running much more smoothly, but none of them would say whether or not they were recorded from a real PS1 or a Raspberry Pi. And I'm gonna go ahead and summarize for you the nearly page-long script that I had typed up of me troubleshooting my X station and PS1 Digital trying to find out what was causing the slowdown by saying, it turns out old Jimmy Hoppa's last time with the game was on a PS3, which did have it running much better due to it essentially being emulation. So yeah, maybe I shouldn't have led with that since it was a problem that essentially never existed, but if I saw this video and I was used to this game running much better, I'd be wondering about that the entire time I watched it, so might as well get out of the way early. Okay, so outside of potentially playing a little slower than you might remember, Neketsu Oyako on the PS1 is a really fun beat-em-up with a few systems that make it a little more than a Final Fight clone. You can perform special moves with fighting game-like quarter-circle inputs, and they don't drain your life like the normal specials do in one of these games. Although you do have the more traditional hit a button and the bad guys die while you lose HP kind of move. You can also overflow your max health, which may not sound like that big of a deal, but think back on how many full roasted chickens were wasted in your playthroughs of beat-em-ups on the SNES and Genesis. Imagine if you could grab that food whenever you came across it in these games, even if you were on full health and it just added to your max health points. Honestly, it's kind of a genius move and I'm left wondering why we haven't seen it in more modern beat-em-ups. It really does change up the way you go into playing one of these games, and speaking of which, each of your characters will play wildly different from each other, which is another way this one sets itself apart from other titles in the genre. Now just to be sure, I'm not saying that in the normal, one is fast but weak, one is heavy but strong, and the other's in the middle kind of way. For example, Tor is the only one who can run infinitely instead of your usual short dash, Ryo has a special move that uses the jump button, and Rando, being the only adult on the roster, is the only one allowed to pick up beer. It's a really interesting collection of ideas that lets the game feel separate and distinct from the titles that inspired it, but not so different that it feels like a totally new genre. However, outside those ideas, Neketsu Oyako follows the tenets of the beat-em-up style pretty strictly. It even has you chasing after a kidnapped family member, not that you would know that if you just downloaded the ISO and started playing the game. It seems like the game's entire inciting incident is told via the manual, so if you didn't read that, you would genuinely have no idea this title even had a story until you beat the last boss and find out that you've been fighting this entire time to save Rando's wife, who was kidnapped by a CD company called Big Black. So yeah, it is a little weird not to include a story in a game until the very last cutscene, but to be honest, that's kind of par for the course here. Everything about this game feels... Well, not exactly loose, but certainly not tight either. It's sort of hard for me to explain, and it doesn't mean that the game is bad, but as I play it, I just get the feeling that, yeah, this was definitely a launch title for a platform that essentially didn't exist a week before. 
I mean, hits seem to connect reliably, and you can beat the game without much effort, but when the action gets heavy, things just don't feel right. As an example, Ryo's attacks feel uncomfortably short-ranged, and when I catch bad guys in a combo, it seems like it's really easy for them to just fall out of it before I finished hitting them. Like, I'm still here attacking, and the animation seems like it's connecting, but they just sort of fall down and get back up ready to go, and I haven't finished the combo yet. I also noticed that if you pick up a weapon, your ability to pick up health items or anything else is severely limited. I don't really know what causes this, but when you have a gun or a knife in your hands, you have to be standing on the exact center pixel of the item you want to grab, but when you're not carrying anything, you can snatch stuff off the ground with ease. It's also admittedly kind of weird to give the player so many moves and not tell them about it in the actual game. Outside of the manual, I don't think there's a single piece of in-game text or dialogue telling you to input quarter circles for some of the moves. And you know, that's not exactly the worst thing you could put in a game. It certainly can be nice, sort of naturally discovering that a game has secret moves, but I'll say without them, this can feel like a much more bog-standard, middle-of-the-road beat-em-up. Those extra moves really do contribute a lot to keeping things feeling smooth and dynamic. I mean, I guess if more beat-em-ups used those kind of fighting game inputs, it would be understandable to not let the player know about them because they would know to try it out anyways, but this is one of the only ones I could think of. Maybe Battle Circuit by Capcom used them as well, but it's been so long I could be wrong about that. And lastly is something that seems very, very strange, even in context. Instead of redrawing the character and enemy sprites for when they're facing a different direction, which is what happens in most games, these guys just clone the original sprites as a single texture or image or something and then segmented that into a character. It took me a while to notice this, and I assume most people playing on a CRT would have to look pretty hard for it, but I found character sprites would be dithered if they were facing left, but not if they were facing right. And the same thing happens with enemies, only it's reversed. And believe me, if a little dithering was the only interesting aspect here, well, I'd still mention it, but I wouldn't be sitting here at 3.32 in the morning typing up a storm about it, I can assure you. Alright, so when facing the non-standard sprite direction, which by the way, I don't even know if we can call these sprites anymore, but anyways, they look like flat images that were cut up into three or four parts, with each section moving in slightly off unison to give the illusion it's the same sprite animation you were looking at when facing the other direction. And oddly enough, it was actually the character Ryo's eye that clued me into this whole situation. Every once in a while, it would seem like she either wasn't being scaled properly or maybe she should feel very, very lucky to have survived so many serious strokes. And after talking all of that shit, I have to make sure that I'm clear that I really, really like this game a lot. I've always been a fan of nice-looking sprite-based beat-em-ups, and this one adds a hell of a lot to the formula. I mean, the levels can be a little boring sometimes, but then sometimes a whale will jump out of the ocean to eat the specific section of bridge that you're standing on, which kind of balances things out a bit. Or even better, every once in a while you'll be able to guess where an enemy is going to fall after a special attack and you can keep him in the air for just a few more hits than you normally would be able to. Niketsu Oyako can be beaten in about an hour, which is on the shorter end of the spectrum, but because the juggle system is so loose and enemies are open to OTGs, every playthrough will have at least a few small moments that'll have you thinking, maybe you can make it to top 8 at EVO. It's a great little stress reliever that you can throw on when a friend comes over and have a killer time with it. And that's not some kind of a hypothetical because I recently just did that when my buddy came into town and it made the game a much more fun experience. Now, you certainly don't need an English translation to enjoy it, but since one exists, you may as well use it. Besides that, an actual PS1 disc is probably going to cost you a C-note to pick up for yourself, so you decide. Free in English or 100 bucks in Japanese. And if you just so happen to save a few dollars because this video kept you from buying the game physically, you know, I, I would gladly take what I would call my fair share of those savings.
Okay, so I can admit we have cheated with this list in the past, or I guess potentially in the future, depending on where I place this section in the video. The term cheat there meaning that we've covered stuff only tangentially related to fan translations, and I'm here to assure you guys that all of that ends now. Or a little bit after this, and really even then it's not a promise. The Unworked Designs project has a history steeped in classic gaming lore. Now, for those of you who weren't around one trillion real-life years ago, Working Designs was a prolific name in the 90s. They would buy up the distribution rights for Japan-only releases and do all the localization themselves. Which, of course, was great for little PS1-era weebs like myself, but beyond primitive Nihongophilia, Working Designs became a bit of a tastemaker. The games that they would choose to distribute in the States were always very unique, colorful, and great representations of gameplay styles that you were less likely to get from Western devs of the day, which was invaluable back in an age before every console's full international library had been backed up to an internet archive, before information on import releases could be found with a two-second Google search. For some of the younger people watching, truly, I don't think you can understand how hard it was to get your hands on, let alone play, a Japanese PS1 game. It feels like a bit of an understatement for me to just say that it's significantly easier now, but let me put it this way. In less time than it would have taken me to verbally explain the process, I just downloaded an import game, transferred it to an SD card, and booted it on a real PS1. We're, we're playing that game right now. So yeah, a company giving us easy access to a sector of games that the average person probably could never hope to see, it's an overall net good, right? Well, yes, but it's a little more complicated than just that. Outside of straight up translations, Working Designs was pretty well known for taking a more hands-on approach in terms of content. Not only would the team regularly add in references to American pop culture events or figures that obviously weren't present in the original scripts, but they would also mess around with gameplay elements. You know, stuff like enemy damage value, starting HP, or experience rewards. There really wasn't a lot that was safe from the editorial hand of working designs, and the tendency was to make changes oriented towards increased difficulty rather than a user-friendly experience. And so, over the years, the company has seen its previously untouchable reputation tarnished ever so slightly, and all of the criticisms essentially coalesced into the Unworked Designs project, a series of hacks and retranslations that aim to replace some of the more controversial aspects of the Working Designs release library. And there are a lot of these out there in the wild, which I don't exactly have time for all of them, but I figured let's take a quick peek at a few of the more interesting ones. My first run-in with the Lunar games came from their PS1 remakes, and I don't mind telling you that I spent years and years never knowing their first tome was actually on the Sega CD. Just like the aforementioned remakes, Working Designs handled the initial SCD US distribution for the Lunar series, and that means, as usual, a litany of Working Designs specific changes. On top of the expected localization alterations and additional pop culture jokes, they also changed stats, added new mechanics, and messed around with a few graphical elements, although that last one does seem to be at the request of Sega themselves. The Unworked Designs version of the game was put out by Studio Lucia and aims to address most of those issues. The script remains unaltered to my knowledge, but they did revert any graphical alterations to their original Japanese forms, as well as reverting characters and enemy stats to their base states before working designs went in and started tweaking things. And believe me, those changes make the game much more enjoyable, but I think the real MVP here is the fact that Studio Lucia was nice enough to change the previous all caps font to a mixed case one. I would imagine most of you guys don't know this, but I was born with dyslexia, so when I look at an RPG dialogue box, oftentimes I have to sit there and wait for all the letters to unjumble themselves in my mind before I can read them. And when you already run into problems reading text from boxes, the worst thing in the world is a geometric shape filled with letters that are all uniform at a glance. I'm being dead serious when I say that this one single change takes the game from almost unplayable for me to really damn fun. I've started up a new game of Eternal Blue on the Sega CD maybe two or three times in the past and I've never made it further than an hour because my reading disability mixed with the font makes it nearly impossible to follow the story at a comfortable pace. I mean sure, I am technically capable of reading what's on screen here given a bit of time, but imagine watching a really interesting movie only you have to pause and rewind with every piece 
piece of spoken dialogue so you can re-listen to it a few times and finally understand what it means. Essentially what I'm trying to say is that it sucks, but on the plus side, this little issue kind of opened my eyes to the idea that accessibility in video games may affect more people than I originally thought. But hey, going from best to, I guess, least necessary, we have the removal of the world-famous pay-to-save system. Now, if you go to YouTube right now and watch a random video covering this game, you have a better than good chance of hearing the reviewer mention how annoying it is to pay a currency to save your game in an RPG. And you know, call me crazy, but this never even approached being an issue for me. I don't know, maybe there's genuinely something wrong with the way that I'm wired, but the idea of paying a currency to save does not sound like that big of a deal to me, and with my limited time with the game, it never, ever was a problem. But it doesn't really matter because you don't have to worry about it. It's not in the game and, I don't know, I guess I'm neutral on that idea. As for Eternal Blue itself, it is exactly what you would probably be looking for if you'd just gotten done playing its predecessor, Lunar the Silver Star. The story is a touch darker than that first entry, but the characters are all really expressive and things still manage to be expectedly anime cute. Did you say something, Ruby? Oh, great. Tell me you're hearing voices now. I wouldn't say Eternal Blue is my favorite JRPG, in fact I think I still prefer its PS1 remake, but it is really fun playing through what is, in my perspective, a demake of a game that I really enjoy. If you'd never played a Lunar game before, this is going to be a killer title to start off with, but I feel like people will probably get a little more ease of use out of the remakes. Speaking of which... Luna, all the exciting adventures in the world mean nothing if you're not with us. This isn't just my adventure, Luna. Now, I'm 100% sure I played other Working Designs releases before this one, but the very first interaction with the company that I can remember is with Lunar Silver Star Story Complete. Like I said before, I had no idea this was a remake when I first played it, so really none of that mattered as far as I was concerned. All I needed to know is that the graphics were 2D, bright, and colorful, and there was plenty of anime FMV. Hey there, kitties. My name is Nash. I'm a level 3 apprentice from the famous magic city of Vane that floats around the Goddess Tower. Essentially, this turn-based JRPG was made for Teenage Me, and even now it remains my favorite working designs release by a country mile. But of course, that does not mean it was perfect. A pretty good chunk of time after I first played the game, I would find out that working designs went particularly hard on this one. They decreased the XP rewards and the silver found in chests while increasing enemy stats and the MP cost of some spells. They even took out a note placed in the game by the developers to help players figure out a puzzle. Which, looking back, actually explains a lot. Every time I start a new game of Silver Star Story Complete, I always dread that process because I know it means trekking back and forth between Berg and the Dragon Cave just to grind my level high enough to even make it to the halfway point. It is a very tedious process and believe me, it's 100% necessary if you want to make it out of the first dungeon. Which is why we have the Unworked Designs patch by Supper and WoW. And I gotta say, the start of the game here is so much more fun to play through now. I find that the US release of Silver Star Story stops being tough around the point where you get to the Magic City of Vane, but there's a solid chance that's because of all the obscene amount of grinding I would do before that point. Actually getting to play the game with the original Japanese stats and EXP payouts was way more fun than I would have imagined. Maybe it's because this is a game I'm much more familiar with than any of the other unworked titles, but this change here felt the most tangible to me. By the time I made it to Quirk in the Dragon Cave, I had gained tons more levels than I would normally be used to, and I was able to make it out of there only grinding because I wanted to, not because I needed to. And I think that might be where this release is most valuable. If you ever got filtered by the relatively boring and difficult start of Silver Star Story Complete, maybe all you need is a little more EXP after every fight and bad guys that don't beat your ass quite so bad. And before the obligatory get good comments, I have beaten this game in its original form on the PS1, it's just way more fun here. And I hope some of you take that advice and try this version of the game out because it remains an absolute gem. The music, the traditional JRPG gameplay, and who could forget that gorgeous late 90s English voice acting. And maybe I'm out of line here, but Null is a way better companion than Rose in Eternal Blue ever was. I can see myself putting some genuine time into this hack. Already I'm loving how much more approachable it's made the game start without taking away that harsh edge that keeps you from falling asleep while you're playing it. 
As far as I'm concerned, the Unworked Designs version of Silver Star Story Complete is now the official way I'll be playing it from now on, and I suggest you all do the same, because sometimes a bastardized version of a Japanese original song is objectively the best version. Wishing on a dream that seems far off Back when I was a kid, my family didn't exactly have the kind of walking around money required to dive into the new world of optical disc gaming, so instead I would use game magazine advertisements as a sort of imagination springboard. Within a single page spread containing, I don't know, four or five still screenshots, I would map out an entire game in my head. How it would sound, its events, or even how it might control, all based on a bunch of pictures. This made a nice little place I could retreat to, and the depressing reality of not being able to afford every single video game on planet Earth as a 13 year old would wash over me. And as I describe what I hope is a very common phenomenon, I can see clearly in my head a specific advertisement. One that not only looked great, but showed off a game so in my wheelhouse I was almost sure it was made for me. And this is the ad right here, for a Sega CD title called Pop Full Mail that either ran in a lot of magazines back in the 90s or I've just been reading the same two over and over again for years on end, which honestly both are pretty likely. The Sega CD was always a holy grail for me growing up. As a kid who could never even hope to afford one, that CD add-on represented what I thought was the pinnacle of high-end gaming. The way I saw it, a guy who came home to a disc spinning in that thing probably looked like this and could only play it in between long bouts of getting mega laid. Which for all I know is still true because to this day I've still never owned one. I mean sure, I could load up an ISO via the mister anytime I want and get very accurate video and audio out of it, but sadly, I don't think I'll ever get mega laid. Which I think perfectly leads into the unworked designs patch for Popful Mail released by Supper. This hack restores enemy stats, damage taken from environmental hazards or falls, and item prices back to their original states in the Japanese release of the game. Because my first time with this game was actually using a previous release of the Unworked Designs patch, my perspective may not be too valuable, but I can tell you this. This is a much better experience than I would have had had I played the game all those years ago when I was obsessively poring over that ad. Really at this point, if you are looking to play Popful Mail, I can't think of a reason why you'd want to play the Working Designs release of it. I mean, you might argue you're looking for an experience accurate to what could be had at the time, but even then I could say that the original Japanese release would be the developer intended way to play the game. And if we're being realistic, old game design is already going to be at least a little jarring for someone used to modern titles, so I would say there's no reason to artificially exacerbate that. But moving away from the patch and into the actual game, I'd say this is exactly how I imagined it would play staring into that ad all those years ago. It's basically Ease 3, but somehow even more 90s. You navigate the game 100% as a side scroller, and I gotta say it makes level layouts really unrealistic. The combat on the other hand is pretty... Well, I mean, you're looking at it, and I can assure you, you have the entire gist of it. You do eventually come across other characters that you can recruit to your party, each one bringing some kind of cool ability to the table. Stuff like new attacks or higher jumps, plus all three of them have independent life bars, which does make the game a little more forgiving. But you'll notice there, I had to use a qualifier like, more forgiving, and that's because this can be a really tough playthrough. Our main redhead here has the fastest legs in the party, which is good, but she's also really slippery to control. Your momentum in the air carries you for what seems like miles, which makes it really easy to bump into bad guys, which does hurt you. In the pre-patched version, you would go down after just a few hits, but here things are a little less extreme. I found the best move is to grind gold in the starting area until you have enough to grab some leather armor and a wooden shield. With both of those, the upcoming boss is much easier to tackle. Now you could just save before the fight and try to learn his tactics by fighting him over and over again, but for once, I feel like grinding is the least mind-numbingly repetitive option there. And I'll go ahead and admit here, I have not played too far into this one past what I needed to to compare it against the original Working Designs release, or I guess more accurately, the previous Unworked Designs release. 
But even with such a limited first glance, I can tell that this is going to be the version of the game that I reach for when it finally comes time for me to actually beat it. Which, judging by how much fun I've had, I'd say is going to be pretty damn soon. You capture me? You're a riot, kid! <laughs> See you around! <laughs> And rounding off our little coverage of the unworked designs releases, we have Magic Knight Ray Earth on the Sega Saturn, which, if I'm being honest, is a platform that I've always been infatuated with. Mostly that's because it was a console I never owned as a teenager, but also because its game library seemed to better represent my, at the time, newfound appreciation for all things anime and Japanese. Sadly though, it was also a library that I would have no access to until a friend of mine just sort of gifted me my very first Saturn, which I immediately kitted out with a pseudo Saturn cart that would allow me to play imports and more importantly backups. So there I was, finally playing one of those holy grail kind of titles for anyone collecting retro games and I was only able to come up with a single thought, god damn this thing takes a long time to get going. But after that 30 to 40 minute mark when you actually start participating in gameplay, it turned out to be exactly what I wanted it to be. A nice, beautiful looking, simplistic action RPG with more personality than mechanics. Obviously, that first time trying it out was with the working designs at it, and even then I could remember being really bothered by how many hits enemies could take, how long they stayed invincible in between those hits, and how much damage they could do to me. Well, I finally sat down with the unworked designs released by Supper, and things feel worlds better here. Looking over the list of changes, Supper says this patch addresses damage values for both you and your enemies, and hell, I didn't even know the bad guys had been sped up in the US version, but he fixed that as well. It doesn't make any changes to Victor Ireland's translation in any way, but there is an undub patch which keeps the English text but swaps in the Japanese voiceover from the original. Now personally, a bad English VO is about as comfy as a baggy old sweater, so I'm probably going to be opting out of that, but the option is there for people who want something a little more pleasing to their tastes. My friends call me Yumi. I'm 14 in the 8th grade. As for the actual game, it's great. It might be a little tough to control at first because your characters have a bit of momentum to their movements, which means when you let go of a direction you're going to need to account for your high school age magical night coming to a stop past the point when you let the button go. That momentum also plays into the mechanics as the longer you walk the more momentum you build eventually leading into a dash. And I do not mind telling you right off the bat that I hate this mechanic. It takes way too long to get a full dash going and most screens aren't even big enough to allow for that kind of a distance to be walked. I mean I guess it would be one thing if changing directions didn't mean starting back from zero but that is definitely not the case. It was supremely frustrating for me but aside from that this is a perfectly charming game. It's about as colorful as any video game ever has been before and getting to see 90s era anime cutscenes every so often is sort of its own reason to pick it up. I can't exactly guarantee you this isn't coming from a place of 90s era nostalgic bliss, but I really recommend this one. I'll warn you, you're going to have to put yourself in a mindset where you can more easily forgive the kind of mistakes and bumps in the road that can show when you're not copying the same template every other AAA developer is using, but if you can do that, you've got a great little quasi-Zelda-like on your hands. It might seem like there's not exactly a reason for the unworked designs patch, and there might be some kind of truth to that, but now that I've played the game in its intended form, I don't think I could ever go back. So if you're watching this video and you've never played Magic Night Ray Earth, especially if you never lived through the 90s era of game design, you definitely gotta try this one out. And if you do, I think the unworked designs patch will make that transition a little smoother.
The animate a video game adaptation is a concept as old as either video games or anime, and with the popularity of Sony's PlayStation here in Japan, it stands to reason there would be a disproportionate amount of them that would never make it out to the West. But this one's a little different. Unlike the no doubt countless anime games we're going to come across as this series continues, I got a bit of personal history with it. I may have never heard of the manga Ganmu before. I don't know, 12 years ago, but I am familiar as hell with its mid-90s OVA, Battle Angel Alita. Like most people, the anime was my first introduction to the series, and I assumed like most, it would be years and years before I would learn that it was just a small look into a much larger story. I bring all of this up because me getting my hands on the PS1 release of Gunmu sort of perfectly completes a very weird circle of events for me. Okay, so it goes like this. I watched Battle Angel on VHS in the 90s, a small look at a wider existing Japanese property which in turn gets me interested in the idea of pursuing more, which obviously transitions into an obsession with import games and media that never made it to the US, which rather perfectly ends in me playing a Japan-only release of a PS1 game that retells the events of that Battle Angel VHS. You really and truly could not write a more perfectly unimportant but simultaneously poignant scenario. I love it. But getting back to the actual purpose at hand, Ganmu Kase no Kyoku covers quite a few chapters of the Ganmu manga and like I said that includes the one that made it into the US released OVA. The story, for those of you plebs who have never read the manga, which includes me, is that of Gali, a cyborg developed specifically for combat. It seemed like after her purpose was served, whoever made her basically just threw her in the trash and eventually a cyber doctor of sorts named Ido stumbles across her torso. So now that she has a new prosthetic body and I guess a new life, she has to learn about the world that she's been born into, a place that exists below a floating city's trash chute. Essentially her hometown is made up of all the stuff the city above didn't want anymore and the people inhabiting that town sort of feel the same way about themselves. As you might expect of a place with that kind of description, crime is the prevailing career path and to help deal with that, individuals are allowed to collect bounties on bad guys by becoming what's called a hunter warrior. After finding out the hard way that Ido is one such bounty hunter and that she possesses an innate proclivity for violence, Gally becomes one too. Like I said before, the game covers quite a few arcs from the manga, but I haven't beaten it yet, so I really couldn't tell you how far it takes the Ganmu story. Like I've already said, I haven't read the manga, but the game does seem to follow what little I know about its story pretty faithfully, and the gameplay does as well. After you register as a hunter warrior, you could beat the hell out of criminals and deliver them as bounties earning you cash. Instead of using an experience system, Gunmu uses currency for everything from buying healing items and weapons to restoring HP and improving your stats. You can eventually buy parts to augment your cybernetic body too, which offers a great buff versus debuff kind of dynamic. At the start of the game, you don't exactly have a lot of places to explore, so it can get kind of tedious moving back and forth between the same three locations trying to trigger story scenes, but you will eventually unlock more small PS1 polygon dioramas to explore and beat ass in. When running around some of the more seedy back alleys, you can be attacked by criminals, giving you a chance to mess around with the game's real-time combat. Before you get into a fight, you're going to want to hit the select button, which enters you into a combat stance. This changes around your controls and gives you the actual ability to fight back. And I'm not going to sugarcoat this, combat here is very close to sucking. It's really stiff with slow movement speed and hitting buttons means committing to the entire animation that's going to play out because nothing but an enemy attack can do anything to interrupt it. If things get too hairy, you can hold down the R1 button and hit one of the D-pad directions to dash, but there's a few frames of wind up for that, so you're either going to get hit a whole lot while using it or figure out pretty quick that you need to respond to things just a second or so before you think you do. Wait, there's no way I wrote that. Just a second or so before you think... Yeah, genius, dear. tell them to be fucking clairvoyant. It, <laughs> it's incredible that I get paid to do that. I'm not even taking it, I'm leaving it in, I'm leaving this all in. The attacks feel good enough when they actually connect, but they have the tendency of locking you into a full combo after doing what anyone would do given this fighting system, and that's mashing buttons a little too much. It's certainly not what I would call a very user-friendly combat system, but it is one that you can learn and get relatively reliable results from. However, that learning process can be excruciating. It's going to require you to run back and forth between wherever you're fighting and Hunter HQ to heal yourself a lot. 
During that time though, you'll be learning the game's mechanics and gaining extra stats, weapons, and items just from the grind, but before you've gotten yourself to that point, things can feel very unfair. At the start of the game, you might only be able to last two fights before needing to return to HQ to heal and restock, and that's when you're not being one-shotted. Those early moments can form a pretty effective casual filter, but I promise you things get way more fun and loads more satisfying once you've increased your stats a little and bought an okay weapon. The flow of the game follows the manga, which I'm told has very short arcs that keep a very monster of the week kind of feel, which may or may not work there, but I think it fits perfectly in this game. And honestly, so does its presentation, although I do have to be honest, this may very much be one of those Jared only kind of cases. Which is to say, it is a very early PS1 kind of look. They use a lot of 3D models made up of big geometric shapes and flat shading to cover them. Only a few of the more important characters have actual textures applied, leaving everyone else looking very simplistic. Hell, if you're paying attention, you'll probably notice most NPCs don't have faces or mouths, which, you know, unrelated. Anyone remember that game Groundstream Saga? Yeah, me neither. The backgrounds have a very cool design to them, but it's not necessarily in a wow, those are impressive graphics kind of way, but more of a wow, that's a really unique way to mask a literal ton of technical limitations kind of way. Of course, I can admit that this look may have a special place in my heart and no one else's, but there's just something about seeing someone create a cool looking background out of like four rectangle shapes and a single black line as a texture. And yes, what you're thinking right now is correct. There's about a million better looking backdrops on the console, but sometimes instead of seeing a game's actual graphics, you can start to see the heart that went into it, and I think that's what's going on here. When I first started playing this translation project more than a year ago, I would notice some text was a little misaligned or sometimes it would extend past the borders of a dialogue box. All issues that are very easy to ignore or not even notice at all, but in a dumb accident, I actually lost all my captures for that session. And you know, I say accident like it was no one's fault, but truly I'm physically incapable of being organized. I even somehow managed to lose the translated ISO that I had downloaded. So I grabbed a fresh version of the translation to replay for footage and it looks like nearly all the issues that I had first run into had been fixed since then, which is awesome to see. I was still able to find a few formatting errors, but they were so infrequent I'm not 100% confident I'll be able to find one in my captured footage for an example, which is more than good enough for me. Now getting to how I actually feel about the game, personally I wouldn't call it a must play unless you fall into one of these highly specific categories. You've got to either be a mega fan of the Gunmu property, a mega fan of PS1 era graphics and presentation tricks, or just someone who's really into the idea of experiencing Japan only releases and wondering how different their lives could have been if this obscure title would have somehow landed on the shelves of their local EB games. It's okay, you can belong to all three of those simultaneously, there's nothing wrong with that. But outside the weirdos, I have to admit this is a really clunky game with more than a few unwieldy rough corners that might be in need of a gentle sanding, but there's also something that endears me to it. I mean, outside of the weird battle angel to video game YouTube content creator pipeline, it just feels like a game that I played in my preteens. So maybe give this one a try if you like the source material or really enjoy early PS1 game development, but unless one of those two things can make up for its other flaws in your mind, I wouldn't go too far out of your way. I've mentioned this a million times, but as a kid, I was a PS1 head through and through. I did not care much for the N64 or the kind of games that most people would use to sell me on it. And you know, as I play through some of these Japan-only titles for the console, I'm starting to realize that things could have been very different for me. It seems like so many of these games are the exact kind of experiences that I would have been looking for on the system, and I assume through that, I probably would have grown to love the rest. And speaking of which, today's example of that is Custom Robo, a cute little kid-friendly action RPG released in 1999 and translated to English by Star Trinket in 2017. The basic setup is similar to any other would-be toy franchise looking to expand into the advertising world of video games. You play as a fresh-faced kid who's really into this new competitive toy game called Custom Robo despite only just getting one five minutes ago. 
But luckily, his cousin lives in town and has promised to show him the ropes of the fast-paced world of tiny robot fighting. Past this, I honestly don't know if there's any actual story here. I must have played for a good three or four hours and never once saw anything outside the introduction of new challengers and a series of tournaments that span a few different world maps. Which if I'm being honest is perfectly fine because I was really vibing with that format. Getting into these custom robot fights is actually really fun and gives you a chance to gain new gear at the end. Gear that makes a very tangible difference in how your little robot handles. It's an addicting loop actually, which is helped along by a relatively kid-friendly approach to sound and graphics. I'm happy to say that we're using an emulator here, which means we can disable the 64's nasty looking built-in anti-aliasing measures and the result is kind of glorious honestly. I would also have to imagine that the added processing headroom of emulation led to the smooth pace of combat that I experienced because the N64 was a lot of things in its day but a 60 FPS monster was not one of them. I'm pretty sure you guys know that I am a real console video output kind of guy but when emulation is able to solve the problem that is the N64's awful frame rate, it's kinda hard to argue with it. Oh, and this is completely unrelated, but I want to give two big thumbs up to whoever decided that the footsteps needed to sound this hilarious, because that man's a hero. Sadly, I can't really say too much more about the game, though. I mean, I did play this for a good long while, and I had fun with it, but a lot of that fun came from repetition. I must have fought a million of these little robots with human faces and had a blast doing it. I didn't really progress anywhere in any kind of story and I didn't really discover any new gameplay mechanics past getting free gear after fights and choosing which piece to wear and which one not to. I mean it is great for what it is and might be one of my favorite fan translations so far but it's just not the kind of game that exists much further than a surface level explanation. Custom Robo is a killer little title that, had it have been released in the West, could have shaken up what I consider to be a very bland library on the 64, and please, before you skewer me for that, just know, I also think the Switch is a giant piece of shit, so make sure you get all your hits in when you can. In all seriousness though, this is an easy recommendation for me. It's a simple game, but it's just as fun as it is uncomplicated. I've got to imagine a kid would really get a kick out of this one, but I can also personally confirm it works on adults who are you know, mentally in the same place as a child. When growing up, I was under the impression we were all living under a strict 8 and 16-bit dichotomy. Essentially, you were either fighting on behalf of Sega or Nintendo in the console wars. I think I might have been in my 20s when I found out there were actually other players in that conflict and by that point, prices on the used market and RGB mods were enough to keep me away from fully dipping my toes into the pond of the PC engine. But when the FPGA-based Mister came out and one-to-one -one hardware emulation was a main selling point, the planets perfectly aligned for me to get my first taste of some TurboGrafx-16. And to add a second juicy layer of Avalanche Reviews lore, I've always loved Sailor Moon. So you might think the Japan-only Bishoujo Senshi Sailor Moon visual novel on PC Engine would be right up my alley, and first off, you don't know me, so don't go around assuming shit. And second, yeah, you're right. The story appears to be its own thing, as opposed to rehashing something that happened on the show or the manga, although it has been a while since I stand Sailor Moon, so I could be wrong about that. At the start of the game, you could pick your Sailor Soldier, which alters how the story plays out, and we're obviously going to be going, but the only rational decision a person could make in this scenario, best girl of all time, Ami. One night, while the girls are all asleep, Artemis and Luna notice something strange. You know, the kind of strange stuff that's worrying enough to wake up a teenager on a school night, but not so urgent that it requires them to do anything about it. During school the next day, the odd occurrences continue until we find out the defeated Nephrite has somehow returned from the dead and has fought his way back to Earth to warn the Sailor Senshi about a looming threat coming from the digital world. This new guy here is using a rare artifact to bring back Queen Beryl and her minions and is now controlling them, all culminating in him erecting a barrier around Tokyo so he can absorb all of the energy within it. 
Sprinkled in between all that is the kind of stuff you'd expect from a story about high school girls that's marketed to middle school girls. You'll get boys asking you out and you'll have to balance at least a portion of your teenage friendships. I don't want to go all Dark Souls and paint every life management sim with the same brush, but there's sort of no avoiding it. If you like Personas 3, 4, or 5, you'll probably enjoy at least a portion of this game. Now obviously, you can't go expecting the same level of depth, but the general idea behind those titles seems to be alive in this one. As far as gameplay goes, honestly, you could make a pretty solid argument for this game not having any. It plays out like a typical visual novel of the era, which means you experience most of the story through static screens, some heavily compressed voice acting, and dialogue boxes. It's also got like zero downtime, so expect to speed through the story in like three hours. I actually sat down with this one with the intent of just capturing enough footage to make this part of the video, but I ended up making my way to the very end of it, and that last section was so interesting I sort of had to complete it. That being said, there are a few moments where you're going to need to provide some kind of input. First are these choose-your-own-adventure parts where you can influence the story's events a bit. I assume it doesn't make a huge difference in the way things ultimately play out, but that combined with the ability to choose the other Sailor Senshi makes the replay factor pretty high here. Now, there is one more actual piece of input-driven gameplay to be found here, but it looks like this, and I promise you it does not play any better than it looks. You might run into two or three of these moments throughout the story and they are just the absolute worst. The scenery may change, but the rules stay pretty much the same. You've got to grab five of whatever these are and each one spawns in as you grab the last one. The worst issue is that the controls stick like hell, meaning if you go to take a corner and you don't hit down on the d-pad at the exact pixel perfect moment, your character is going to get caught up on that 2D corner until you wiggle them back and forth to get them off. On top of that, the scrolling is really choppy and the animations have so few frames that I sort of felt kind of sick playing through these parts. Something that was not helped by the fact that it took me 15 real life actual tries to make it past the first one. These things are annoying and the opposite of fun, so what do you say we move on to a much nicer subject, this visual novel's presentation. This being a PCE game, you can expect the usual bright colors and sharp pixels that the platforms become famous for, but I will say I was a little disappointed by the lack of animations. Before you say it, yes, I understand this was essentially an 8-bit machine, and given that fact, these graphics are pretty amazing, but when I see something of this caliber, I don't know about you, but it makes me, at least internally, expect more than 2 or 3 frames per animation. But like I said, it does look amazing, so I can't exactly fault it too bad. It's no secret that this console, or at least this era, was responsible for some of the best 2D artwork to ever make it into any video game, which is something you're not going to be able to avoid as you play this. I will say there are at least a few bad looking screens, like this one right here where Ami looks like she's just been informed her entire extended family's died in a house fire, but everything else looks amazing. There was one thing that really got under my skin though, and I'll warn you it's gonna sound really dumb even in the context of things that bother me. Alright, so follow me. In an RPG, when someone's saying something, the developer will put their face somewhere near the dialogue box so you get an idea of who's saying what, and that makes a lot of sense in a human comprehension kind of way, right? Well, in a move that I would certainly call interesting, this game decides to buck that long tradition by just including a single image of the character that you chose at the start next to every single piece of dialogue spoken. Something that shouldn't have mixed up my brain quite as much as it did, but I truly had to actively not pay attention to it or I would get confused. They do put the name of the speaker in there with the dialogue at the bottom, which does help, but to be honest, at a certain point, I just started listening to the spoken VO because this messed with me so bad. On that note, most of the Japanese used here is relatively simple if you're familiar with the less honorific elements of the language. It also doesn't hurt that if you hear a word you can't translate very fast, you can look down and see it typed out in English. 
And now that we're this deep into things, I can go ahead and admit that I sort of hate visual novels. To be fair, it's not even really the genre's fault. It's mostly thanks to the low effort and even lower budget garbage that makes up 75% of the PS2's Japanese library. I'd say this one, however, is exactly my speed. Nice pixel art, bright colors, a cute story, and most importantly, zero downtime. If you're already a fan of this franchise, or I guess just cutesy anime from the 90s in general, I really can't recommend this game enough. It does an amazing job at emulating the writing and feeling of the TV show, and getting to look at Lush's PC Engine pixel art is just icing on a cake that admittedly is already pretty well iced. Beta, the Emblem of Justice, is one of those Japan-only releases that I have a bit of history with. The first time I ever visited the world-famous Super Potato, about 10 years ago, they had Feta running on a CRT, and at the time I was so impressed by the sprite art and animations on display that I grabbed it right then and there. Coming back from that trip, I started playing the game and understood essentially none of its story, but I really did get into its combat. I eventually put it down though, because really there's only so many RPG battles you can play without knowing the story behind them. And it turns out I'm sort of an idiot, because since 2009 there's been an English fan translation available thanks to Magic Destiny and Stealth Translations. And now that I can actually understand it, I've gotta say the story is almost exactly what I thought it was. In that story, you play as Brian, a soldier in the Imperial Army, and in a very Final Fantasy IV kind of move, Brian and his unit have been carrying out the kind of attacks that make a guy question his allegiances. During the intro, there's a raid that's supposed to be targeting Liberation fighters, but Brian realizes they're just cutting down regular villagers. When he's ordered to kill someone who clearly didn't have it coming, Brian takes a swing at his superior instead, which obviously lands him in the gulags. While waiting for his execution, Brian's visited by a fellow soldier who introduces himself as Ayn. This guy says he's also fed up with the things that he's been ordered to do, so the two join forces and mount an escape. But in doing so, they sort of run face first into Brian's commanding officer. Just in the nick of time, the two are helped out by another dissatisfied cog in the machine, and together they mount an escape, albeit temporarily, because for a good portion of the game, you're gonna find these guys pursuing you. Eventually, you come across the Liberation Army you used to fight against, which expectedly leads to an alliance and a campaign to take down your old boss. Really and truly, Feta's story is nowhere near original or deep, but I still kind of liked it. What I didn't like, however, is the humor that feels like it was inserted by the fan translators. I certainly could be wrong about this, but it smells to me like this script had a focus more on localization than translation. It's certainly not something I'd stop playing the game over, but it does feel like every dialogue box contains some kind of an attempt at humor, and I just didn't get that same vibe from the original script, what little of it I understood at the time. That being said, like I mentioned before, I could be wrong about that. I mean, it's not like RPGs were totally devoid of bad humor back in the 90s, but if you ask me, this feels specifically like a translator putting his or her signature on a project. On the gameplay front, things seem to be broken up into two different sections. First up, you have the world map sequences, where things work sort of like a mystery dungeon game. Everything including moving is turn-based, and after you've made a move, your enemy will follow suit. If you and an enemy end up occupying the same location, you'll get into a fight that seems like it was inspired by ones in Shining Force, which means the battles will play out like your average turn-based Japanese strategy game, only when attacks are carried out, you're taken to a different perspective with much better graphics and animations. If you ever have before, you've likely seen this kind of style in games like Fire Emblem, Walk and Rotor, or the Super Robot Wars series. I can tell you personally, I tend to enjoy it more when a developer puts all their effort into animating the regular overworld sprites for stuff like attacks, but you can't really deny how good these screens end up looking regardless. Outside of the attacks and the special screens that come with them, combat in Feta is actually pretty bog standard. You've got special attacks, magic, healing items, and 
really that's about it. In terms of mechanics, it's definitely not the most complex or deep role playing game, but there is one nice little auxiliary system you can mess around with. In a fight, you can gain a bit of a reputation based on how many bad guys you strike down versus how many are left alive when attempting to win the battle in a way other than total annihilation. Some of these fights might have special conditions like getting your whole party to the other side of a bridge or something. In those scenarios, the game actually keeps track of how many enemies you kill and party members that aren't down with violence will actually leave as a result of killing too many. Now I'm not sure about you guys, but I would much rather be appropriately leveled than looked at as a benevolent leader, so anyone not happy with my quote unquote bloodthirsty management style is free to pursue employment with another resistance movement. Another cool little feature is how the game handles party members falling in battle. When someone's HP drops to zero, they're out of the fight, but anytime after that fight, you can go to the camp screen and mount a rescue mission. I guess the expectation there is that anyone who goes down in a fight gets imprisoned by the enemy. It's a cool little idea and one that I don't think I can remember seeing before in any other RPG. It makes sure that dying still holds weight as far as gameplay goes, but takes some of the edge off the normal permadeath system that you would find in a game like this. I'll say though, I'd be much more likely to engage with this and everything else surrounding the combat if I wasn't missing every third attack that I tried. I feel like instead of using accuracy or a lack thereof to balance your game like this, you could just give everyone a little more HP to account for hits landing more often. And I say that because sitting through two screen transitions just to watch your attack whiff activates some kind of wild prehistoric anger center in my brain. But on the plus side, even when my characters are missing a quarter of their attacks, I still get to watch these absolute works of art play out on screen. There really is something to be said for how intricate these images are and how well they animate for a Super Nintendo game. I don't even really care that 75% of the screen is taken up by heads up display. Whatever the developers had to do to achieve this kind of graphical fidelity on this platform is perfectly justifiable if you ask me, up to and including human sacrifice. But on the other end of that spectrum, I would say the music here is pretty lackluster. Most songs aren't too bad, but almost none of them fit the sections that they're paired with. It just sort of feels like a generic action soundtrack, with not much identifying it as a fantasy game. If anything, I could see these tracks fitting much better in a mascot platformer from the era. If you happen to enjoy both the Shining Force and Super Robot Wars franchises, but you find yourself wondering what would happen if they were both locked in a hotel room together with nothing but a crate of whiskey and a drum of industrial strength lubricant, well now you know. Sicko. Well guys, I would say that's more than enough for today. If I did my job correctly, most of you should already have a few of these patches in the process of downloading, but if that's not the case, don't you worry. I've got about another 25 pages of script for these bad boys just waiting to go. And hey, if there's any fan translations you guys think I should know about, feel free to drop a suggestion in the comments. I think I'm going to go ahead and get back to work on the kind of stuff you're more used to seeing on the channel for the moment, but I've also got another 700 gigabytes of captured footage from fan translations, so I wouldn't worry about this being the last time you're going to see this subject covered on the channel. And I think that's all I wanted to say, so I guess I'll talk to you all in the next one. But until then, as usual, I'm Jared. Shh, don't go having a child. And this is Avalanche Reviews. Hey guys, thanks for hanging out for a bit, and a massive thanks to David Vink for being nice enough to show up and talk about Treasure of the Rudras. Make sure to swing by the guy's channel and show him some love. And you know, since we're on the subject of love, I do have a Patreon if you're looking to support more content like this, and of course joining up as a YouTube member is also a massive help. But if you guys don't have the money or the time for that kind of stuff, thanks for just making it this far. Well guys, have a good one, and here's hoping we see each other again very soon.